I talk about some of the, the varied projects that we've been um, essentially sucked into in the last seven months or so. Uh, it's going to be a bit of an overview of the different projects. Uh, I'm going to start with um, how we got involved. So, as, <clears throat> as Stephen said, we're really a cancer lab. But the director uh, sent around this email on the 20th of March uh, about PCR testing, wondering if we could uh, get something going because he was thinking it was going to be some kind of uh, test of employees um, separate from the kind of uh, clinical testing that, uh, uh, that Tony and Christine were just talking about. And so within a couple of months, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, produced this um, fairly simple uh, um, manuscript, which, was, which is a preprint. And it was headed up by Joel in the lab. Um, and basically it was to compare a few different methods to get things going uh, using reagents we could get our hands on. And so um, the BGI kit actually ended up performing better than the others tested, which is, which I guess is why we're here giving this talk today. Um, and that was either on extracted RNA or uh, uh, using direct. So that was without any RNA extraction, which, which obviously really reduces the time uh, required to, to test things. So then, uh, based on this, um, which you can look up for the details, uh, we utilize the BGI kit in downstream applications. And there's been quite a few things. Uh, so there's about five different projects that we've been involved in. Um, I'll talk, I have time to talk about four of them. Um, so at the Shawl, the Shawl trial is a, is a saliva screen of LTR employees that we're just uh, getting going now. I'll tell you where we are with that. Um, as you can see, there's, there's lots and lots of names on here. I'm not going to go through everybody's names. Uh, please have a look at them because I just don't have time in 25 minutes to, to mention all the names that are involved. Um, and then also there's a next-gen sequencing project that I'll summarize, uh, headed up by Jeff and Lawrence, and then uh, photodynamic theory by, by, headed up by Kari. And then there's an RT lamp test that we've been optimizing in, in, in my lab, like many labs around the world, but I'll tell you our experience so far. And what I won't have time to go into is the very elegant work by Keith Pardee's group on, on two-hold switches, but uh, I'm sure you'll get a chance uh, if you're interested to hear about Keith's work uh, later on that. That's some really cool uh, uh, technology. Um, so uh, the uh, saliva test that we're, we're trying to develop, you know, so we, we wanted to do home collection uh, on saliva uh, uh, to protect LTR employees. Now, obviously saliva has the huge advantage that you don't have to stick anything into somebody's uh, nasopharyngeal cavities, which is you know, painful, awkward, and takes a lot of time. You need specialists, you just spit in the tube. Uh, so lots of groups have shown that this works in symptomatic cohorts, lots of papers on that. Uh, what about asymptomatic cohorts? So there's a gigantic study just come out of Japan with uh, nearly 2000 samples showing that uh, saliva is just as sensitive as an isopharyngeal and just as uh, specific as well. So really good uh, sensitivity and, and, and an amazing uh, specificity. So that means that we can use saliva. Um, so our goal was to develop a saliva screen for LTR uh, employees. Um, so this is the SHAL trial, which is Stay Healthy at Work Lunarfeld. That's what that stands for. And it's headed up by Palm and I Claude, and there's a number of us involved uh, in developing the, the, the other aspects. So we're particularly involved in the saliva test as, I'm, as uh, involving the BGI equipment, as I'm about to talk about. But there's also a whole arm of this looking at serology as well. And the entire population is asymptomatic. And the goal is to try and track the, the natural history of infection and immune responses in our own environment. Um, so here's the here's the, um, the work stream that we uh, ended up setting up, and basically this is the, the the collection part here. So people spit in a tube at home. You know, you get up in the morning, you spit in your tube, about two two and a half mils, and then you add a, an equivalent volume uh, of um, of buffer. I'll talk about this buffer in a minute, um, and then that gets deposited in, the, in a collection box, and then by one o'clock on a Monday gets uh, gets taken to the lab for transfer. And what we do is we record, we have a team that records the barcode and then transfer it to these deep well 96 well plates. And you know the barcode is scanned into a, a, a laptop. And then it goes to the MGI extraction robot. This is the same uh, type of equipment that Tony was just talking about. Um, and that uh, does uh, 96 well plates. And then we transfer that to uh, 384 well plates. Um, this is the, and, and the purpose of this is to reduce the volume, the reaction volume to save cost. We can, we can save the cost by about a third of the reactions by doing 10 microliter instead of 30 microliter reactions. And then we go to uh, RT-QPCR uh, using the, the BGI uh, kit. 
Um, so I'll just take you through some of the pilot things that we did. Um, you know, we'd done, we had done um, you know, non-robotic tests before just to make sure everything was cool. But then we got to the robotic part and we had this initial disaster. So uh, this was the, the first troubleshooting test we did. And what happened, basically what these graphs show is uh, uh, results with saliva spiked with synthetic RNA at various concentrations. And also you have to look for human genes just to know that your RNA is intact. Um, and so there was lots of false positives. Uh, basically, all these arrows are pointing to the false, false, sorry, false negatives, false negatives. So we were not detecting um, um, the, the, the viral RNA in many cases, which is just completely useless. Uh, so what we figured out was going on was that the sample transfer was a problem. So there was 160 microliters being taken up by the robot. And our buffer, as I'll describe in a minute, contains SDS uh, to inactivate the virus. And what was happening was just simply the bubbles were uh, going up and soaking the plug in the pipette tip. Um, and then because this tip was uh, plugged and, and wet, uh, the, the suction was screwed up. And so you had failure to remove the buffer after uh, uh, binding of the RNA to the beads. And so you had SDS uh, carrying on into the reaction, which of course is gonna kill your RT-PCR reaction. So very simply, what solved that was changing to a two times 80 microliter instead of 160 microliter uh, transfer. And so then we did the second test. And now this again is with spiked uh, RNA and it's set up like this checkerboard uh, uh, type of plate so that you can also assess for cross-contamination. This is a very efficient way to assess for cross-contamination. And you can see there's no cross-contamination. The, the negatives were zero and the positives were all positive. And the other thing that we measured, because we knew how much RNA was spiking, we measured the recovery. And the recovery by this protocol is 94%, which is really, uh, really very nice. Okay, so uh, then, then we started to try and improve the buffer to make sure that, the, to solve various problems in the saliva or potential problems in the saliva. One of the, the issues with saliva is it can be goopy, right? It can be viscous. It's amazing, actually, the different consistencies of people's saliva. Um, and one of the ways you can solve that is actually by adding a, a, a reducing agent, such as DTT, dithiothetyl. But di DTT is stinky, um, so uh, you don't want to use that if you can avoid it. So what we put in the buffer uh, to give out to people in their homes is something called THPP, and it does the same job, but it's odorless. Um, it's actually more stable as well. And so in the third test, we actually tested whether THPP influenced the, the reaction. And this was, this is again, was, was spiked in um, uh, synthetic uh, RNAs. And actually, it, uh, it, um, it, the, the THPP was better than without uh, THPP. So we used the THPP the reducing agent to uh, um, do that. And so basically, these disulfide bonds, what they do is they just um, increase uh, cross-linking between uh, mucins you know, in, your, in your saliva. And this gets rid of that. Um, and so uh, the next test then was to repeat a checkerboard test, same thing as before, but now we're not using twist RNA anymore. We're actually spiking in nasopharyngeals from Tony uh, into these, into the, the, the red samples here. And again, no crossover, no, 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 no problems in the blanks, and um, only one out of 40 of our positives were, were negative. So we've got really high specificity and sensitivity in our test. So everything's working well now. We've got a, a nice flow and we've got this finalized buffer. So the buffer contains SDS to kill off the, any virus that might be there. Although remember, these are asymptomatic populations. Um, we've got EDTA to collate uh, uh, ions to, to minimize RNA's activity, although the SDS should also denature and kill it. THPP to reduce viscosity. And then finally, we also include bromophenol blue. And the purpose of that is so that you can, the operators can easily see when they fill up a well in the, the deep well 96 well plate. Um, and then I've gone through this before. Um, so, you know, a typical result, here's the typical uh, kind of a result. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is, uh, you know, a donor who's positive here, um, or this is a spiked sample. And then um, there's the actin signal, it's positive too. Here's donor two with, uh, with their positive actin signal, but no uh, signal for the, for the virus. So that leads me to talking about interpretation. And we use the same interpretation as Tony does uh, in the clinical lab, which is to say that if you're negative for viral RNA and positive for human RNA, then you're negative for virus. But if you're positive for viral RNA, irrespective of what you are for human RNA, we call that a positive. And then lastly, if you're negative for both, that's an invalid test because the negative result for viral, we don't know whether that's because they don't have virus or because the RNA disappeared or the reaction was inhibited in some way. So that's really important. 
Um, so, okay, so here's the results so far. We've been going with this trial now for two weeks. Two, uh, we, we collect every two weeks. And uh, we're hoping to get to about 500 participants in the Institute, but so far we've got uh, 70 enrolled in the first week and that rose to 99 by week two. And you can see that the, 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 the number of invalids is low. It's 3.6% uh, so far and 100% virus negative, which is actually really quite comforting to know that your employees are virus negative. And there's a lot of people involved in this um, uh, as I've got down here. In addition, uh, we've plotted here the actin values in week one versus week two, which are very similar. They, they hold pretty stable. And then uh, we also looked at the um, stability of RNA in the collection buffer at left at room temperature. You know, how long can you leave these sitting? The, the people do this at home, they bring it in. There's a few hours between collection and sitting in the box. We actually left them for two weeks. And you can see that these, you know, after two weeks, the, the, nothing's happening to the RNA except for this, this one sample. So it looks like it's pretty uh, stable. So that's the results so far for the Shawl trial. Um, the second thing I'll talk about is the work of, uh, uh, from, mainly from Jeff Rana and Laurence Paletti's uh, lab, which uh, we've had a small role in, um, but uh, this is uh, developing a next gen sequencing platform to detect uh, SARS -CoV uh, um, coronavirus 2. And this, this is um, uh, built on a technique called SPARSEQ, which they previously used to assess multiple uh, exon um, intron splice junctions, and they published that paper a couple of years ago. Um, and they're using a similar technique to detect multiple areas of the virus. And so they, you know, they, 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 they target all these viruses with uh, these viral regions with uh, primers to create these, um, uh, these, these cDNA templates. And they also target endogenous genes uh, to, to, to ensure RNA integrity of the sample. Uh, that's plated onto uh, each, each sample gets a well and a 364 well plate, and then these get barcoded. Um, and then they, all of these get combined now, and you can sequence them all together. And the capacity of this test is in the tens of thousands, um, maybe 50,000 and up, and you can do in one go. Although that, uh, th th then you come to collection uh, of sample issues as well, which, uh, which is uh, another barrier to overcome. Um, anyway, so the test uh, is uh, uh, as follows, was developed as follows. So first of all, you build a test development cohort using samples from Tony, um, and then you establish like rigorous SOP and you use like rock curves to uh, build a classifier. You know, what, what cutoff gives you the ideal sensitivity and specificity, that kind of thing. And then you take that and you validate that in a huge cohort. So in this case, uh, 663 patients. And here's some of the data. So what we were doing, uh, we were helping Jeff by running the, uh, the BGI uh, test on samples to get CT values uh, for all these samples that he was running in the, in the NGS. And as you can see, as the CT value goes up on the, on the RT-PCR test, you know, the viral reads uh, drop, which is exactly what you would expect. And the sensitivity, which is in the red graph here, you can see the sensitivity is really, really good. And as you'd expect, sensitivity starts to drop off as you get to uh, lower uh, level samples. And if you compare that to a, uh, their data to a 22,000 patient cohort, um, these are the, so on, on the x-axis here, this is the, this is the log 10 copies per mil of, of patient viral titers. So the vast majority of patients actually um, have virus uh, somewhere between 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8, you know, so in other words, a million to um, 100 million copies per mil of virus. In their in their um, nasopharyngeal sample, um, and then uh, so these are these are the main ones you want to, to 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 detect because infectivity is is most typically happening above a million copies per mil, and you can see that the test is really good in terms of sensitivity up here, but actually it's still really good uh, at the uh, these low at these high, sorry these high CT values, which is low copies of um, of uh, uh, virus per mil. And actually you can calculate the sensitivity. So at 10,000 copies per mil, it's still 97% sensitive. And at 4,000 copies per mil, it's still 92% sensitive. And the accuracy of the test is really high. So this is a fantastic uh, uh, tool. Um, and now the goal is to develop, is to use this really to develop broad pathogen screening array with sequence, using sequencing info. And of course you can use it to mark variants um, and you can also quantify host responses, you know, look at things like interferon response, et cetera, not just look at viral genes, but endogenous uh, immune responses. And so it's a really nice scalable platform for routine profiling of respiratory viral infections. Again, a large number of people involved in this. And there's actually a preprint that was just submitted last week. It's available on uh, Research Square. If anybody's interested, please go and, and look for this uh, for, for Jeff's uh, paper. 
Okay, the third thing uh, that we've been involved in is helping uh, Kari Wine and Brian Wilson um, develop a photodynamic therapy trial. So photodynamic therapy is, it's a very uh, nice technique um, that uses uh, an inert uh, compound, which is, doesn't do anything in the absence of light. But once you add light, it, it, it generates uh, oxygen radicals, which are, which are good for killing off um, pathogens. And it's actually used clinically for cancers, so head and neck cancers, or esophageal cancers, and also for infectious disease, and including things like acne um, can be treated with this uh, uh, procedure. And so uh, it's got other names apart from photodynamic therapy, it can be referred to as photodynamic inactivation or photo disinfection. Um, and uh, basically what we've done is to help um, uh, 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 Layla in, um, in Brian's lab the, to do an in vitro test. So what happened was uh, she set up this, uh, this, this basic test I'm gonna show you here. So they took some virus, uh, mixed it with the inert compound and the inert compound, and there's lots of them you can use, but one it's commonly used is methylene blue. You set up at different concentrations and then 10 minutes later, you radiate with some light and then you extract the RNA and you do some RT-PCR. Uh, this is the, a more detailed view of the setup. So you've got your two plates and here's the controls. You've got virus only, virus plus the methylene blue, virus plus light, and uh, the, all of that should have no effect. And then you have virus plus uh, the chemical plus light, and that should reduce the, the titer of the virus. And here's just the 24 well plate setup where you've got this. This is the light. You put your plate onto the, the light box here. Okay, so we did this um, with a, a harmless coronavirus first. So this is the, the OC43 coronavirus. Um, and, you, and these are just different uh, levels of light and then different concentrations of methylene blue. And you can see that it titrates nicely with, uh, with, the, uh, with the level of light. So more light, more killing a virus, and you get you know, a, a, upwards of 100-fold uh, inhibition, a loss of, of, of RNA. Um, and we've also done it with SARS-CoV. Uh, so this is CQ value here or this is it converted into viral RNA copies per microliter in the RNA uh, solution itself. And so here's, here's a typical sample here. It's, it's got, you know, um, this one had about um, you know, uh, tens of thousands, which went down to, uh, you know, a few hundred copies. So again, a hundredfold inhibition and an increase in the, in the CQ value. So this, this looks quite promising, at least it works in vitro, but does it work in vivo? That's the whole point of the trial. Um, which is now funded and REB approved. Um, so uh, Kari is hoping to lead this study at, uh, at Sunnybrook, another hospital in Toronto. And the goal is to assess viral load before and after the treatment in the anterior nair, so the front nose. So here you can see somebody who's actually being treated. We've got their fancy goggles on and this kind of crazy looking, uh, you know, Star Wars looking stuff going up, up their nose. Um, and what that Star Wars stuff is, this Health Canada approved SteriWave system. It's the Ondine Biomedical. who are based in Vancouver. And they're actually using this in hospitals to, uh, to minimize uh, pathogens that are present in your nose. So when you go in for an operation, you've got lots of these pathogens up your nose, which can actually be quite dangerous for you in, in uh, uh, post-surgery. And so they treat people and they're, they're having some really good uh, um, uh, results with that. Um, and so, uh, uh, as I said, we're going to, uh, you, know, you know, take pre and post um, treatment swabs and then use the BGI RT-PCR test to quantify viral load. And in addition, uh, Kari will send some of these to the Saskatchewan Health Authority uh, to get viral uh, infectivity loads actually quantified before and after treatment. And the goal is to test in, in clinical and non-clinical environments. And also, um, what she wants to do is to optimize uh, uh, a new, so, so um, Undone Biomedical have also created instruments which are not just for the, uh, the frontal regions of the nose, but also nasopharyngeal, so deeper in, and then also oral light uh, delivery devices. And they're gonna use what's called phantoms for that, which are anatomically accurate upper respiratory tract models. By anatomically accurate, they actually replicate the, the light, um, uh, the, the light characteristics of a uh, human tissue. So the, the, the penetration is similar to a, to a human um, uh, upper respiratory tract region. So that's that trial, that's where we are with that. Um, and then lastly, uh, I've got some time to talk about the fourth thing, which is uh, trying to develop a point of care test. And there's, you know, there's dozens and dozens of labs around the world trying to develop uh, these uh, loop mediated isothermal amplification tests. Um, and the reason it's pretty obvious um, why people are so keen to do this is because LAMP has a number of key advantages. So the biggest advantage is that this is an isothermal 
test. So it doesn't require a fancy PCR machinery. You just need something that holds the temperature around about 65 degrees. Um, the detection is also very simple. There's a number of ways to detect, which I'll show you. Again, you need minimal equipment and it can be adapted for this point of care test. So basically without um, spending too long on the, on the reactions involved, you have about six primers, which have all sorts of ability to, to hybridize to all sorts of uh, regions of the viral genome. And you end up cre creating these loop products which fold back in themselves, which helps the whole amplification process. And you end up with a whole bunch of uh, a sort of ladder of DNA products um, uh, after, after uh, essentially after about 10 to 30 minutes. So it's a really fast uh, uh, reaction and it's used widely in a number of uh, bacterial and viral uh, detection um, diagnostic systems around the world. So just to talk about the, um, the, the, the various ways that we've used, uh, um, the, way, the ways that we've detected this in order to optimize our, our protocol. So, you know, the classic way to detect this is actually a color reaction. The pH changes and it goes from red and a no template control to yellow. So, you know, you've got product here, it's very simple. But, you know, typically the simplest version of this is like a one, uh, a one shot color assay. So you can get more false positives here because eventually one of the problems with this uh, assay is, you know, everything eventually amplifies. Um, and so we prefer, for optimization, we prefer to use the, the fluorescence, the dynamic fluorescence uh, type of assays to discriminate false positives. So here's a whole bunch of these. Uh, uh, this is Su Ying's reaction going ahead quite nicely. And you can see the time, this is the time to reaction. So once we cross this line, that's it, that's a positive. Um, and um, just to illustrate the problem of the one, the one time point test, so, this is a false positive here. You can see it's kind of got orangey yellow, hard to tell, but it, you'd probably score that positive. But what if you look at the, the, the dynamic uh, assay, you can see this is coming up really late. So what you do is you try and set a, a, a cutoff threshold, a time to reaction cutoff threshold, and this would be, this would be called a, a negative. Um, and uh, you know, I don't have time to get into the gigantic amount of optimization that Su Ying has done, but just to summarize, you know, she went through a whole bunch of primer tests um, and a whole bunch of different uh, gene targets. And she used you know, a low copy number of, uh, uh, of, of target RNA to compare primers. And she did different primer concentrations. And she did this using four replicates initially. And then she did it again with a whole bunch of, a whole range of them with uh, optimized guys. She did this 10 replicates now, really trying to get better idea of sensitivity. Then she took her four optimized targets and then she asked, can we increase sensitivity again by adding things? that are denaturing agents, which, which help to, these help to deal with loops, secondary structure loops in your, in your target sequences. And so guanidine and betaine were, were both helpful actually at low concentrations. Um, and then another thing that she found helpful was combining primer sets. So she actually puts in, uh, because she had three optimized viral targets, she combined them in pairs and she found that a couple of these pairs uh, actually improved the sensitivity. And then finally, now we, now we collaborate with Tony again, we get a bunch of samples from Tony in order to do a receiver operator characteristic curves, the rock curves with the patient samples. And we do that with both extracted RNA and direct. Of course, you wanna do the direct in the, in the field in the, in the point of uh, care assay. And so these are, this is these data, this is the rock curve uh, data. So rock curves are used to define cutoffs. And then you, at that cutoff, you can calculate sensitivity and specificity of your test. So this is just a direct RT-PCR uh, test. So this is with no extraction. This is straight for, this is really straight into sample. And this is comparing it to the gold standard BGI test on extracted RNA. Um, and so the way that rock curves work, you've got your true positives up the Y axis and false positive rate on the, on the X axis and a good test has zero uh, false positives. And so you know, as you go up, uh, as you go up different cutoff levels, it doesn't matter, you just reach zero and one here, and that would be a perfect test. But in the real world, uh, tests do this. They, they come off the, the, the axis here and wander across um, into a point where you've got like uh, nothing, nothing good is happening. And so what you, what you try and calculate is the area under the curve, and you're looking for something close to one for a really good test, and then you can calculate your specificity and sensitivity. So direct RT-PCR works really well. Um, uh, LAMP also with extracted RNA works incredibly well. But what we find is even with our supersonic uh, version of LAMP, the test is not great. The area under the curve is kind of crappy, um, but the time to reaction uh, that, that gives us these kind of sensitivities and specificity is actually good, it's only half an hour. 
Um, so what's going on here? So is this a useless test or is there something actually useful here? So when you actually take the samples and you now plot, this is the clinical, uh, uh, the BGI test um, CT value up here. And this is the time to reaction for the lamp reaction across here. Um, so this, uh, this, this region here has the lamp positives and this region here has the lamp negatives, lamp positives, lamp negatives. And these are clinical positives and above here are clinical negatives. So you can see that the, the lamp positives um, are, are are actually in the direct lamp, they're all with CTs, clinical CTs of below 30. And once you start going up there, above 30, you start to lose the, the lamp sensitivity. Um, and, and, and so uh, this is actually good news uh, because these are the virus concentrations that are actually infectious. And up here, these are the virus concentrations where you're no longer infectious. So there was an article recently, uh, just a few days ago, in, uh, the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is putting out a big appeal that we should be uh, thinking about um, uh, scaling up to do um, low sensi lower sensitivity um, point of care tests to capture uh, these, uh, these, these, these patients which have a high uh, viral load and are infectious. So you go above Above this, uh, you go above this region here. Now you're infectious because you've got really high uh, viral load, um, and most of the the, P the PCR tests are probably detecting anything above CT30. It's usually around about here where you're post-infectious, and you're even though you're still positive by PCR. So there is value for this lamp uh, assay to detect these high titer and infectious, and if you can detect them in the field in an hour. Um, with, uh, with a simple test. And if you could do several tests at once, you could test a classroom at once or uh, a factory or something like that. And you could uh, do sentinels to try and find infectious people quickly um, uh, before, before they start infecting other people. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Um, so we're actually collaborating uh, with a group called LSK Technologies. Now LSK Technologies was started actually by um, uh, by former uh, trainees in Keith Pardee's lab, and their goal has been develop to develop a, a low-cost um, plate reader, which will do multiple samples, so it can actually handle 96 well or 384 well plates, and you, you load up your samples, um, and then you stick your samples into here. It can heat up to 65 degrees, and then it can read off the reaction, either by colorimetric or by fluorescent. And so we've been a test site for the development of these, um, and we've been working with uh, the uh, Livia and Katrina and, and Seri and LSK and Keith to get this going. And then Keith has had successful collaborations in the past with groups from Colombia uh, and Ecuador to, 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 to roll out uh, Zika virus tests, um, point of care Zika virus tests. And so uh, Vara Silvia and Patricio and Camila are all helping uh, to, to, to get this going in Ecuador and Colombia. And then Jeff uh, in, in Waterloo is, is trying to get this going in, in Ontario. And so that's really what we're trying to do as far as uh, uh, a low cost um, point of care test based on, on LAMP um, goes. Okay, so that's me done. Um, thank you for listening and happy to take any uh, questions.